Hey everybody, so one thing I've been doing is I've been trying to keep track of questions that I'm asking now that six months ago I didn't even think to ask. So for example, what is the difference between a pandemic and an epidemic? I never thought about that question. Uh, another one, and this is going to sound really strange, but number two, what is social distancing? I mean, that phrase now has become so common that for a lot of us, we don't even remember the point at which we didn't know that phrase. Well, the truth is, just a few months ago, nobody knew what that phrase was. Question three, what's flattening the curve? Again, we all know what that is now, but just a few months ago, we did not know what that was. Uh, number four, why does it take a long time to develop a, a vaccine? Uh, number five, here's a question I've asked uh, in this season. What is the proper dress code for working at home? Got to be honest, I'm a, I'm a mesh shorts and, you know, t-shirt kind of a guy. And so I've really wrestled with that one. What exactly are you supposed to wear when you're working from home? Uh, number six, is it okay to have my daughters cut my hair? And the answer to that question is absolutely yes. Good job, Anna and Heidi. You know, I, I've had all sorts of... of questions, and, and some of them have been, been spiritual in nature, so probably the most prevalent spiritual question for me has been, what's God trying to teach me, and what's God trying to teach us during this time? And, and I think for me the answer, or at least the most, uh, the answer I've thought about the most is, I think God's trying to teach us a lot about the meaning of life. And I, I've spoken about that before, and I'll probably speak about that in the future. But the question I want to address today is one that I've thought a lot about over this pandemic, and it's pretty simple. It's, what's church? You know, it's been really interesting without being in the building. It's caused not just me, but a lot of us to reflect on that question. What is the church? Now, I know the church is not the building. You know the church is not the building. Like, we know that cognitively. But the truth is, most of our memories of church experiences happen in the building. The, your, your Bible class experiences, your, your, your experiences of watching people get baptized, the conversations that you've had with people, some of which have probably been trajectory changing conversations, the hugs, the handshakes, the high fives, those happen in the building. And so when the building is taken away, it makes us wonder, well, what, what really is the church? I mean, let's just rewind just a few months ago. February 8th, February 9th, do you remember what was happening? We had the largest event that's ever taken place in the history of the Memorial Road Church of Christ. We had 3,600 people on our campus for the Lee Strobel event. And they were spread all throughout four different rooms in our complex. We had people driving in, and they didn't come because the parking lot was so packed. I mean, do you remember the electricity that was permeating our church family? It, it was incredible. God was doing amazing things. There were so many people from our neighborhoods and from our community checking out our church family because of that event. We had momentum. We had vision. We had strategy. And then overnight, it all went away. And everything that we think about when it comes to church was just taken away. No building, no bulletin, no singing together. And now we've been trying to do the, the technology thing and, and worship in our living rooms, and we've been trying the best that we can, and, and we're happy to offer that service. But the truth is many of us are sitting in our living rooms wondering, what exactly is church when you can't be together? And so what I want to do today is I'm, I'm starting a new series, and we're calling it Beyond a Building. And the idea behind this series is the church is one of the central images and the central ideas in the whole Bible. And what's amazing is that New Testament authors, when they're trying to describe what exactly the church is and what exactly the church does, they use all these metaphors to try to help us understand. And so for the next few weeks, each week, we're going to take one metaphor in the Bible and explore what that metaphor means and how it helps us understand the church. And so to begin, I want you to turn your Bibles, if you have one, over to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. This passage here is, it's one of my favorite passages uh, about Jesus. It's, it's one of those passages kind of like Philippians 2, which is a, a, a cosmic reading 
of Jesus. And so here's what, what Paul says. Verse 15, Colossians 1. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I love that verse, verse because it's, it's telling us the centrality of Jesus in creation. All things were created by Jesus and for Jesus and through Jesus. And in Jesus, all things hold together. And so for me, at least when I read this verse, it makes me want to look at the world and think, the reason we have the world and the beauty of the world is because of of Jesus. I mean, if the, if the world, if creation was made for Jesus and through Jesus and by Jesus, and if in Jesus all these things hold together, then what that means is that, that when you look at a rainbow or when you look at a sunset or when you look at a waterfall, you should see Jesus. His fingerprints are absolutely everywhere. Just a few days ago, Mary and I were taking a hike in southwest Oklahoma celebrating our anniversary, and we saw two dung beetles crawling on the ground, doing their thing, and we watched these two dung beetles rolling their little ball up a hill, and we sat there for 10 minutes. It's like we were watching planet Earth, and it was incredible. We were, we were just stunned in awe at what these little creatures can do because of instinct in the way that their creator made them. And so it made us pause and just sit and wonder, wow, look, look at our creator. Now, I want you to look at the very next verse in Colossians chapter 1. Paul says this. So this is the very next sentence after he talks about all this glorious creation stuff, Jesus and all this stuff. He says this. And he, Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. See, Paul could have gone so many different directions after he starts that passage. He could have gone on to talk about the, the magnitude of civilization or culture, or government, or he could have talked about the sacredness of the individual, because that's how the Genesis 1 narrative works. It's creation, and then it it exalts the the human beings as the pinnacle of creation. Paul, Paul could have talked about marriage, but Paul goes straight from the, the cosmic ramifications of creation, and how we see Jesus in creation. He goes directly from that to the church. And so here's what, what my takeaway is from this and what I really get from this passage is that I have the ability to look at a waterfall or to look at a sunset and be caught in the wonder of God. And you've got your memories of that too. When you, sometimes you just walk outside right now. The weather's been, been beautiful. We, we can get caught in the beauty of creation and think to ourselves, wow, this creation must have a pretty incredible creator. But what I think Paul's getting out here in his sequence of the text is that in the same way that you can look at a waterfall and say, wow, what a creator, you can also look at the church and say, wow, what a creator. When you look at your Bible class teacher or when when you look at that teenager that you don't really know his or her name, but you've kind of seen them around, or when you see this this volunteer working or teaching a, a, a kid's Bible class, like when you see the church... If you have the eyes to see it, you're actually seeing the creator behind the church. And so specifically, in Colossians 1, Paul introduces us to this great metaphor. Did you pay attention to actually what he said the church was? I'll I'll read it again. He said in verse 18, Jesus is the head of the body, the church. And so Paul here in Colossians 1 uses the most prominent metaphor in the New Testament for church. He uses the metaphor body. And body is all over the New Testament. So for example, Colossians 1.24, Paul says this, I suffer for the sake of the body which is his church. Ephesians 5.23, Christ is the head of the church, his body. Now the most extensive passage in the Bible about the church being the body is found in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul really gets into detail about how this metaphor works. So let me read a few verses from 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 15. Now if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, 
it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. I mean, this is an incredible metaphor. And the main point is that your human body, my human body, it works together. So, for example, do you remember a few months ago when I was preaching about iron sharpens iron and I, I used swords for one of my illustrations? Well, I took these swords up to Stillwater in January and I did a similar message where people got on the stage and they chopped cantaloupes. And, and after the message, I was resheathing the sword, just like I'm doing now, and I accidentally sliced my left hand. One of the dumbest things I've ever done. I was like, what is wrong with me? I just cut myself with a sword. Now, when I cut my hand, what do you think the rest of my body did? Do you think my right hand metaphorically looked at my left hand and said, Psh, serves you right. Always complaining. Always saying you're the weaker hand and trying to get attention. Serves you right getting cut like that. Of course my right hand doesn't do that. My right hand instinctively grabs my left hand trying to do what it can do to stop the bleeding. My, my brain gets in on the action and my brain tells my feet, you need to get up and you need to walk somewhere to get a band-aid. Because it wasn't like the worst wound in the world. I didn't have to go to the hospital. But, but point is, my, my whole body got in on the action when one part was hurt. My body worked Together, and Paul's saying the body of Christ should work the same way. We are in this together. Now, I want to read the next part because the next part, Paul really gets into the heart of, of this passage and he really drives home his main point. Verse 24, Paul says this But God has put the body together. I just pause. Can you just think about that for a moment? God has. Put the body together like the church. So what this means is that there is somebody in the church that you don't like. You need to get over it. Because God put that person there. And if you don't like that person, you need to take that up with God. God has placed the parts of the body just the way he wanted them to be. Let's keep going. Giving greater honor to parts that lacked it. God gives greater honor to parts that lack it. In other words, God is very, very interested in marginalized church people. And I think our job is to be more like God and to pay more attention to marginalized church people. People In our church family, there are some of us, and we're, we're in the middle of circles. We've got lots of friends, and, and, and we're not on the fringe. But there are many, many people which are on the fringe, and they're just, they're just looking for someone to pay attention to them. They're looking for someone to talk to them. They just want someone to text them, to reach out to them, just to, to, to acknowledge that they're there. And one of the hardest things to do is to get people that are very well connected in the body of Christ to have the eyes to see those who are not connected because this tells us God sees them. God cares about marginalized parts of the church family. Let's keep going. Verse 25. So God does all this so that there should be no division in the body. God hates division. He hates it. I think God's heart breaks when, when churches divide, when churches split. I think in the heart of God is, is unity and he wants people to come together. Here's verse 26. And this is one of the most important parts of the whole passage. And really this, verse 26 gets down to what you're supposed to do and what I'm supposed to do. So God has arranged all the parts of the body so that the parts should have equal concern for each other. Equal concern 
for each other. Can you just say that sentence with me? Equal concern for each other. This is our job. Now, 1 Corinthians 12 also talks about gifts. We all have different gifts. But I think we have the same goal or the same intent in the body. And that is to show concern for each other. To express that concern for one another. In other words, you were not designed to be in competition with other members of the body of Christ. You were designed to express concern for those very members. You were designed to look at the life of somebody else in the church and simply say, I see you, I care for you, I value you, I notice you. And even if everybody else mistreats you or misjudges you or flat out ignores you, I see you. And I want to be part of your life because we are part of the same body. That's your job, to express equal concern for every member of the body. Because we're all part of the same church family. Now, next verse, 26. I think this is the most practical verse in the whole passage. Paul says this. If one part suffers... Every part suffers with it. And if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. So here, I got got two questions for you. Two two practical questions. I want you to think about these questions. If, If you want to do something this week to apply this text, it's based on these two questions. Here's question number one. It's pretty simple. Who can I suffer with? And if you don't want to end with a preposition on that sentence you can just say with whom can I suffer but it's the same question I want you to think about somebody that you know maybe you know this person well but you might not know them well but I want you to think about somebody that's suffering that you could suffer with that person this is what Paul is saying it is our job to suffer with those that suffer I guarantee you that right now you know you probably know someone that's sick probably know someone that's in the hospital. You probably know someone that's going through some kind of relational tension. Maybe there's someone that you know that, that, whose marriage is just really on the rocks right now. Maybe you know someone who's going through a really messy breakup or a messy divorce and you know they're struggling. I'm telling you, you know someone that is suffering. So it's your job and it's my job to go to these people and, and suffer together. It's what the body of Christ does. You know, something that God opened my eyes to this week is that some people suffer more than others when racism rears its ugly head in our country. It's been really interesting over the last probably two weeks, I've had a handful of people in our church family, some black, some white, want to talk to me about what's going on in the country as far as race goes. In fact, my most recent conversation, uh, I asked permission if I could share some of that with you, and she said I could. I had a conversation recently with Mia Mukes, and she specifically wanted to talk about her perspective as a black woman, specifically in light of the death of George Floyd. Now, I I wish you could have heard the conversation because there's a few things that you need to know about about Mia. Mia is, uh, she's not angry. Uh, She doesn't talk with the aggressive, polarizing, political rhetoric that always happens on both sides of the aisle anytime these stories hit the news. In in fact, she's super informed. She got her her degree in college in African American studies. And so she's very informed. In fact, at one point, her heart, she said, Phil, my heart actually goes out to to these officers. Because they, you know, they didn't exactly know what, what they were doing. And so she, she has a very, very unique perspective on the whole situation. But here's what she really wanted me to know. And she said, Phil, what I really want you to know is that when these things happen in our country, and, and sadly they happen so often, I don't feel like anybody sees me. And I don't feel like anybody notices me. And I don't feel like anybody seeks to understand the hurt that I feel as a black woman. And no one seeks to understand the fear that I feel as a black woman. All I'm saying is I just want, I just want someone to see it. 
well, that was really good for me to hear. Because for me, oftentimes I get so busy and I'm just doing all these things. I forget that certain things happen in the world and, and a lot of people just see it and they move on. But for other people, they, it stops them in their tracks. And this is, what, this is the case for, for Mia. And, and I want you to notice something that, that, that she said. She, she didn't want me to fix the problem. Who can? I, I, I can't wake up tomorrow. You can't wake up tomorrow and fix the problem of racism in our, in our country. All she wanted me to do was just to share it. And if you'll notice in the text, this is so important. If you're like zoomed out or checked out or thinking about something else, just dial in r- r- real closely for just, just a minute here. What Paul says is when one part of the body suffers, every part suffers with it. He does not say... When one part of the body suffers, every part tries to fix it. See, I need to hear that because I'm a fixer. You can ask Mary, when there's problems at home, I just want to fix it quickly, efficiently, and get it over with. Whether it's a broken dishwasher, or a broken sink, or a broken fence, or some kid is crying, I I want to fix it, fix it, get it done, get it done, get it over with, i got to move on. I'm a fixer, and a lot of us are fixers. Paul didn't say when one person suffers, we need to necessarily fix it. He says when somebody suffers, what they really need is they need you to share it. And so I think that this gives us permission to enter into the world of people who suffer and be okay that we can't make it go away. They need someone in their corner. I'll I'll never forget a a conversation I had with Kent Brantley about seven years ago. Kent Brantley was was the the face of the Ebola epidemic, if if you remember this. Kent Brantley was was serving as a doctor in Liberia, contracted Ebola, and he was one of the first people in the States to come back with Ebola, and there was this all, all over the news, and, and they, they, everybody was scared that they would get it, and so to treat him, they, they had all these uh, tents and plastic tarps everywhere. On, the only people that could go into his room were doctors in hazmat suits, and he, he told me about the moment where he thought he was actually taking his final breath. So he's laying on the bed, his, le- his, br- his breathing is very labored. He can, he can barely get the oxygen down. And at one point, it became so hard to suck in the air that he thought to himself, oh, this is it. I am actually taking the final breath of my life. And what he told me next, I'll never forget. This, this blew me away. He said, Phil, in that moment, I wasn't necessarily scared to die. I was scared of being alone. Because in that moment, when I was taking that breath, the doctors were not in the room, and I looked at the window where my family would sometimes come up and be with me, they weren't there. So more than the fear of death was the fear of being alone. And so one of the things we can learn from that is that all of, all of us have problems. I've got problems, you've got problems, we all have problems. And we all want to snap our fingers and just make them go away. We all do. But the deeper need is not just that a problem will go away, but it's that somebody will come into our life and share the problem and share the pain. This is what Paul is calling us to do. If one part of the body suffers, every part suffers with it. You don't have to fix it. You just need to share it. And so what I think this means is that when you, I want you to call to your mind right now somebody that's, that's suffering, someone in a health crisis, someone in a relational crisis, a social crisis, just someone who's lonely, someone who's bored, somebody that, that's in pain right now. And, and, and I want you to put that person in your head and, and I want you to think about the next time you're going to see that person. What are you going to say to that person? See, for a lot of people, that's where they get stuck. They're like, I don't know what to say. It's going to be awkward if I bring it up. Like, you know what, you know what for a lot of people it is? It's... Maybe you know someone and the anniversary of the death of their loved one is coming up. And you're thinking, do I say anything? Well, what if I say it wrong? And what if they're offended? That stops me in my tracks too. I'm always worried about saying things the right way. But here's the thing. Just ask anyway. An awkward ask is always better than a cold shoulder. An awkward ask is always better than a cold shoulder. Just lean into it and say, hey, I don't, I don't know how to say this, but I'm just wondering, how are you doing in light of whatever the thing is they're struggling with? That's what you're called to do. When one part of the body suffers, every part suffers with it. So who are you going to suffer with? Here's question two. It's right out of the text, and you can probably guess what it is. Who can I rejoice with? Or with whom 
can I rejoice? Isn't it amazing that <laughs> you might be more spiritually mature than me, but there are some days that, like when something good happens to some, somebody else, I'm like, well, I wanted that to happen to me. And like the, the jealousy and the envy just, just creeps up. It's human nature. But one of the ways to grow as a Christian is to, to feel joy. And if you don't feel it, just, just really pray through this. Like, I want to feel joy for this person because that's what Paul tells us to do. When good things happen to other people, our job is not to be jealous. Our job is to rejoice with them. This uh, makes me think of a few years ago when, so I, I love the people I work with, every single one of them. The staff in, at this church family is just absolutely incredible. And, and so I was super impressed by, by two of my coworkers a few years ago. Number one is Josh Kincaid. He worked his tail off for years to get his doctorate. And he earned it, and he did a great job, and we were all so, so proud of him. Dr. Josh, we were all excited. Well, so I was really proud of Josh for doing that. I was also proud of Mark Taylor. You know what Mark Taylor did? Without telling Josh, Mark got on a plane, flew to Atlanta to be there for Josh's graduation. Because Mark knows that when something good happens to somebody else, it's, our, it's his job, it's our job as the body to rejoice to rejoice with that person. So let me ask you again. Who is someone that you can rejoice with? And you know one thing I learned from my children in January? Anna and Heidi taught me that you don't have to wait for somebody else to accomplish something to celebrate those people. So we're sitting in a hotel room in January. Where I'm on a speaking engagement trip. And, and it's in the evening. We, we're done with all the activities of the day. And and we're winding down, and the girls tell Mary and I to close our eyes. We're like, all right. So we close our eyes, and we hear all this rustling as they unzip their bags, and we hear them setting out items onto the bed. And then finally they say, open your eyes. And we open our eyes, and there's all these gifts that they've hid in their suitcase and brought to this trip. And so they start giving us things. They, they, they've made all, all sorts of crafts and they've written cards. And they, with their own money, they bought me a Sudoku book. And they just lay out all these gifts. And they start telling us all about these gifts. And we have to stop. We say, what? Why? Like, it's not Christmas. It's not our birthday. Like, why are you giving these things to us? And they say, well, Mom, Dad, we are declaring today is Parents' Day. And you deserve these gifts because you're an awesome mom. And you're an awesome dad. And so we need to celebrate. Isn't that awesome? Now, I know some of you are like, that's not, that's not fair. My, my, kids are, my kids need to do that. But, but again, don't, you're not allowed to feel jealousy. You, you have to feel joy. But, it, but isn't that amazing that they, the kids didn't need an event to celebrate. They just decided today is the day and we're going to celebrate our parents. We can do that. We don't have to wait for these moments to happen. We can make them happen. We can create them. So think about somebody in your life that you can rejoice with because again as a member of the body of Christ that's your job to suffer with people that suffer and to rejoice with people that rejoice now every week week when we meet at homes or or eventually when we're going to meet back together as the body of Christ do you know the best way to remember that we are the body it's the Lord's Supper I want to read you a, a, another passage from Paul, 1 Corinthians 10, 17. Paul says this. I love this. <laughs> Look, think about this verse in light of what we've just talked about. We who are many are one body, for we share in one loaf. And so taking the bread and taking the fruit of the vine, there's so many deep meanings behind these emblems, but one thing they do is they remind us of our identity. Here's a phrase I want you to remember. We take the body into the body to be the body. I'll say that again. We take the body into the body to be the body. And here's what I mean by that. We take the body as in we take the bread and the fruit of the vine. The body of Jesus. His, his flesh represented in these emblems. We take the body, his body, into our body. Like we put it into our mouths and we, we, we eat it and we swallow it and, and digest it. And it becomes part of our physical body. So we take the body, Jesus, into the body, our, our flesh, to become the body. To become the church. 
we take the body into the body to become the body of Christ, his church. In other words, as we take these emblems, the fruit of the vine and the bread, we are declaring our oneness. Of course we're different. We're, we're different genders and we have different opinions and we're different races. But when we take the Lord's Supper, it is our declaration to each other and to the Lord and to the world that we are one in Christ because we're all doing this together. And so I want to say a prayer and then I want you to, to take your communion bread at home. If you'll bow with me. Oh Father, we often forget. We forget who we are. We forget who you are. Sometimes we forget what your church is. And so today we remember the gospel how you entered into our midst and moved into our neighborhood so you could become one with humanity. So you could suffer and die and ultimately break the powers of sin and evil and death which have held creation in shackles for years. Your body was torn apart so you could bring people together. People from every tongue and tribe and nation and color and gender and culture on earth. And so, Father, would you help us capture the magnitude of your body, your church, in this world as we partake of this bread. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And one more time, if you'll bow with me as we go to our Father in prayer. Father, in our minds we see the crucifixion and resurrection of your son Jesus. We see his nail-marked hands. We see the crown of thorns. We see the discarded grave clothes and the empty tomb. Suffering and rejoicing are at the center of your story. We remember God. And Father, we also remember that suffering and rejoicing are at the center of our world too. So Father, help us see the joy of the people around us. Help us hear the stories of victory and overcoming and the stories of simple delight. And help us to rejoice in those stories. But Father, help us also to see the suffering around us. Help us to see the marginalized and the ignored and the lonely and the scared. And help us to suffer with them as you suffered for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.